Hello everyone and welcome back to Asian Agash and in this video I'm going to continue and finish my Soul by Gravelord long in-depth army series and of course the only final way we can finish this series is by talking about non-biasedly the best character in all of Warhammer of course being Nagash the Supreme Lord of the Undead. So this video is going to be all about Nagash and if you want to hear my thoughts on any other bit of the Soulblight Gravelords army I've covered it all already in a long in-depth format so you can go check it out if it's anything like the zombie units, the skeletal units or the vampire units, the sub allegiances being the dynasties and legions or just my thoughts on the normal allegiance abilities and spells etc for the Soulblight Gravelords you can check that out in the playlist for them that you can see on my channel or it'll come up at the end of this video. What I also say is if you guys have got quite a bit of experience with Nagash and you want to share your thoughts make sure you put that in the comments down below and alternatively if you're also quite new and you just want to ask a few more questions or my thoughts about Nagash put that down in the comments as well as I'll try and help you best I can. Again if you do enjoy the video please do me a massive favour smash the like button the subscribe button bell notification massively helps out the channel and of course if you would like to support the channel a step further you can become a member here in Asia Nagash by clicking the join button or there's a link to my Patreon on the top of the description down below but we can get to all of that at the end of the video. So firstly we can't talk about Nagash without mentioning him in the narrative and again this isn't necessarily a lore video but we have to mention him a little bit in the story for those who don't know. So Nagash, the Supreme Lord of the Undead, ancient and malicious, Nagash rules over Shaish as a tyrannical god. At his rasp command march seamlessly endless armies of undead revenants, and by the power of his almighty sorceries have a thousand mortal empires been cast into ruin. Nagash bestrides the realms as a morbid colossus, a terrifying and macabre deity who wields the energies of death as a mortal swordmaster does their blade, levitating above the battlefield upon a storm of shrieking geists. He is the end-given form, the snuffing out of the candle, the last grain of sand draining through the hourglass. All undead beings from the lowliest dead walker to the great mortarchs are his to command, to face him is to face ultimate oblivion, either through his intensely powerful magics or at the end of his cursed blade. There is no being in all the realms who can rival Nagash's command of necromancy. Since pioneering the dark arts, he has abounded with the energies of Shaish, and now his power is seamlessly limitless in scope. With the twitch of his bony finger, he can tear loose the souls of a swath of foes, violently extinguish them, sap them of all hope and vitality, or most dreaded of all, reduce them even the mightiest adversary to a pile of dust. Furthermore, Nagash's mere presence lends the armies of the risen dead a terrifying epitus. Such is his might that he can raise new undead warriors almost faster than an enemy can hope to strike them down and when he focuses his will upon his servants they will be filled with a truly ghoulish vigour. Nagash takes malice pleasure in unleashing these channel hosts against their most favoured champions of his rival gods. Unceremonially dragging them down beneath a tide of bleached bone and rusted blades. Nagash's display of war further displays his arcane prowess by the great necromancer's own hand where these treasures crafted each serves to augment his already formidable might. Murakane, the black armour, is capable of not only warding off attacks but redirecting them in a blast of ending magic. Alakadash, the staff of power, is studded with gems of petrified grave sand that aid the channeling of Shaishan sorcery. Nagash's most prized relic, however, are the nine tomes of Eldric lore that hang from his mummified form on iron chains. Bound in cursed human leather, the nine books of Nagash are the greatest trove of necromantic lore in all the realms. 
So thick is the aura of amethyst energy surrounding the volumes that merely standing near them can see a mortal age, centuries, in a matter of heartbeats. With these tomes, Nagash can master an unmatched stream of incantations, his arcane dominance impossible to resist. As many vampires hate and fear Nagash for the, his dominion over them, as do worship him. When the Undying King calls, however, all soul-like creatures are bound by instinctual impulses to answer. In truth, Nagash often simply demands that their vast armies do his bidding, the service and continued existence of the vampires themselves permitted only so long as they are of use. Yet Nagash also recognises the value of those vampires who prove their worth, in the presence of the Supreme Lord of the Undead, these fiends are largely released from the need to constantly marshal their own hordes. Instead, they are given full license to destroy Nagash's enemies in as bloody and terrifying fashion as possible. So now that we know what such a kind-hearted soul Nagash is, let's see what he's like on the tabletop. So. He's going to cost you 955 points, which I'm pretty sure is the second most expensive point model in the game, second only to the Corn Dragon, which arguably is not really in the game anymore. Yep, it's very sad. It annoys me, but there we are. Play it for narrative, nothing like that. It's not very really competitive anyway. But anyway, back to the gash. Yes, 955 points. Might as well call him 1,000 points. He's going to be half your army in most games in your Soul Black Grave Lord's army if you want to go that way, and obviously taking Bone Reapers if you want that. It's just Quite a good point to mention that, you know, if you want to build an sort of all-round death army where you want to collect all the death armies like I do, um, Nagash is not a bad purchase because he can be used in several armies. But Nagash himself in Soul Black Grave Lords and just generally is going to be 955 points, so very expensive and that's very much what this review is going to be about is how can we justify that 955 points. So also to mention is that he is a unique, obviously, leader. He can't have a command trait artifact, etc., but he is also going to be a single model as well, of course. And he is a behemoth as well. I mean, just check the fucking size of this guy. So then going on to the War Scroll and starting with basically the description of this model. So Nagash is armed with his sword and his staff. Not going to try and pronounce those again. And the gaze of Nagash. Um, he is a war master. So what that means is this unit can be included in a night horn, flesh eater court, also a bone reaper or soul blood green lord's army. If it is, it is treated as a general. Even it is not the model picked to be the army general. In addition, you can still use the army's allegiance abilities, even though this unit is not from the army faction. However, this unit does not benefit from them. So essentially what that means, if you want to take Nagash in a flesh eater court army, he hasn't got the flesh eater court keyword. So that means that really, that's kind of more like a Grand Alliance death army because you're having to mix it that big because like I said, he's half your points, he's half your army. Um, but... By having this War Master trait, what that means is you can put him in there. He's not going to benefit from all the Flesh Eater Court Allegiance abilities and stuff, but you can still have the Flesh Eater Court Allegiance. Nagash doesn't break that, essentially. He doesn't benefit from it, but he doesn't break it. So that's very cool to see. Again, you know, some armies benefit from Nagash more than others, but at least if you want to go for a Death Army, you see Nagash and go, he'd be like a really cool, you know, centerpiece to have. You can do that. And, um,. Yeah, it doesn't break the army allegiance abilities and ruin all your synergy by doing so. So it's nice to see that. And like I said, if you want to collect all the deaf armies, it's a great excuse to do it. Then going on to the next bit, say in his description, he has got the fly uh, abilities. That means that he can fly. You know, he's aloft by all these spirits and a movement of nine. It's not the fastest movement, but his base isn't too big. So he can get around where he needs to, uh, especially with spells and stuff as well. And then you've got um, his companions, which this unit is accompanied by a host of spirits armed with special claws and daggers. Again, if you watch my review of the Mortark and also like the Coven Thrones and stuff like that, same thing there. And then I think the next thing to talk about is his will stats, because then we go into abilities and stuff. So um, his will stats, he's got a 9-inch movement, which again, you know, isn't too bad, like we just said. A uh, 3 plus save, which you need to have on this model. At the end of the day, he's half your points, you know, He's got Bravery of 10 and 16 wounds, so he hasn't even got too many wounds compared to things like Gargants that are pretty much half this guy's points value. So he needs to 
be kept alive. So the 16 wounds is all right, but you really need to protect it. So that's why you'll often be doing a Mystic Shield on him because, you know, Nagash has got enough spells to cast or all out defense, something like that, just to make that free up a two up. And obviously, we've already reviewed lots of different abilities and units and models in this army that can make the enemy worse to hit, make their rend worse, etc. Make you guys survive longer. You can use all of those coupled with Nagash's own abilities to really keep him alive for longer and really make the most out of his heavy point sink he's going to be. And then going on to his weapon, so he gets a missile weapon, which is again very unusual for death. So let's see what it is. So it's Gaze and Nagash, so basically he's just going to stare at someone and cause them to die. So that's very cool. He's got a 12 inch range of that, so pretty good range for death. He's got a 1 attack, freeze and 2s, minus 1 d6 damage. So only one attack and again hits on a three so swinging you roll a two you're buggered but you can do like you know all out attack or whatever the um shooting one is to make yourself get that plus one to hit or you might have manfred nearby and now you're hitting on twos wounded on twos you know would be ones if you could and uh minus one rend and again d6 damage is very swingy but i have used this before and it's definitely a great feeling when you use it against an enemy hero, they fail their save, and then you just do like 5 damage, and then you just kill the enemy hero by staring at them. It's a very cool feeling, and it's definitely a welcome ability for him to have, a nice shooting attack. Then going on to his melee weapons, now he does get all of these, so I just want to mention if you are new and you are building your Nagash, you can either build him to have the uh, sword and the scabbard, or him holding the sword, or him holding the staff, etc., now, it doesn't matter which one you model him as, he gets to use both of them. So it's definitely worth remembering that. So um, his, the staff, I think that one is. <laughs> so it's a three inch range here is the staff. Uh, four attacks, freeze and freeze, minus three rend, D6 damage. So that is very nice because the hit on freeze, wound on freeze, like I say, have Nagash nearby, plus one to hit and wound, or even just all out attack. So that could be twos and threes or twos and twos. With that sort of thing, minus three rent, most of your opponents won't get a save against it. Or if you're going against the big scary things of the enemy army, which to be fair, you might be doing as it's Nagash. He's going to be one of your solid hammers in your army, if not the strongest one, to uh, crack those enemy hard shells. That minus three rent, they'll probably have a six up save. If they have a five up save, then bloody hell, they're putting a lot of resources to keep them alive. And the D6 damage, yes, it's swingy. But the great thing about Nagash is even if you rolled poorly for that, which, you know, on average, you won't. It'll be pretty good. But if you do, when we go on to his sword, it's got a 2-inch range. Now, this does have a damage table stat to mention. So, it starts with 6 attacks, but it will get worse. But you start with 6 attacks. Freeze and force. So, again, not really liking that 4 to wound, but you can improve it in ways we already mentioned. Minus 2 rend, 3 damage. So, what I find here is when I've used the gash, if for some reason the staffs really let me down with that d6 damage... It really gets picked up again by the reliable 6 attacks at 3 damage with minus 2 rend from the um, sword. That's a really good sort of reliable amount of damage because that's still a really high rend and a just a flat damage cache as you got 3 really does do wonders. Like with Nagash, obviously, sometimes you can take him to fight and you can fluff your dice, but the amount of heavy hard hitting attacks he's doing... You probably, you probably won't. I mean, if I compare it to a completely different model, but something I used the other day, which was Shalaxi Hellbane. I absolutely love the model. Uh, really happy how I paint her, etc. We'll use her in my armies. Um, she's not very good on the tabletop, and she costs 405 points. And why I mention her is because she has three very high damage attacks, but she only has three attacks. So what that means is you only have three dice to roll. And if you fluff those, you know, three dice, if you, you roll badly on that, that's it. Nagash here, we've already mentioned you've got 10 dice to roll at very good attack. So chances are some of them are going to do some good work. So I just thought that was worth mentioning. And then you've got the Spectral Claws and Daggers, which are 1-inch range, 6 attacks, 3s uh, and 4s. So surprise it not to be 5s and 4s, which are usually is because these are Nagash. These are more supreme, you know, quality spirits. 3s uh, and 4s, no render 1 damage. But of course, being um, uh, Ghost, Spectral Claws and Daggers, you are looking for those 6s to hit to do those mortal wounds. But the fact that you're hitting on 3s, plus two hit basically compared to normally it's just that extra bit of damage that might be able to finish off that enemy unit that you're attacking or finish off that enemy character just to chip away it's always a welcome addition to always do and never forget about okay so that is his weapons very good there which we do expect for how many points he is costing us then going on to his abilities um the first one we've got is the staff of power so at the staff of power value shown on the unit's damage table to the casting and dispelling and unbinding rolls for this unit. In addition, this unit can attempt to cast 
arcane bolt any number of times in the same hero phase, even if an other wizard has already attempted to cast a spell in that phase. So very good, you've heard a lot of people already talk about this, basically Nagash can just charge it up to be an absolute bomb to just blast loads more wounds of the enemy, so very good there, you can stack it and you can do lots and lots of damage to the enemy. Like I've already mentioned, Soblet Grave Lords have got a lot of ways to do more wounds to the enemy and this is just another great way that you can do it. You used to be able to uh, spam Mystic Shield as much as you can, but obviously the change of Mystic Shield being plus one to save, that would be broken in my opinion. So going on to the next ability we've got is the Nine Books of Nagash. So the Nine Books of Nagash allow this unit to cast extra spells in your hero phase and unbind extra spells in the enemy hero phase. The number of extra spells this unit can attempt to cast or unbind is shown on the unit's damage table. So essentially he can cast normally three spells which we'll get to in a moment to describe how he's a wizard but what that means is that he can cast eight spells before he's suffered damage on the damage table and the damage he has to suffer is seven damage before it drops from eight spells to six spells, which is still very, very good. So this guy can absolutely make the most of his spell casting, especially how um, if it wasn't for the chance of him being able to just spam Arcane Bolt, to be honest, you would probably get to maybe about five spells. And then after that, you don't really have any more to cast and you feel like that kind of sucks because you're missing out on the extra ones you can cast. Um, because he lost the ability to be able to cast any spell by any friendly like Death Wizards and stuff on the tabletop. Which was sad, but at least the spam in Arcane Bolt kind of makes up for it. But so that's what you can do there. And then just to say, obviously on the Staff of Power, it starts off with him being able to be plus three to cast and plus three to unbind of the spell. Which is absolutely huge, there's not many things that can beat that in the game. I think Seraphon might have a way to be like plus four to cast for Lord Croak or something like that, but I seem to remember. But... There's not many things that can beat that. I would say that when you go against things like um, Techless and stuff that I've chopped my head, I think you can also cast one spell or you can cast like four spells of a cast of a or ten or something like that. Nagash has got a good chance of being able to unbind those sort of spells. So the fact that Nagash can basically, a lot of times, you know, if you happen to roll like a 12 to cast, then, you know, you've got a cast of a or 15 and no one's really going to unbind it unless they have an ability that auto unbinds or something like that. So it's very, very useful. Um, and the fact that you're plus three to the unbinds and dispels just helps you be able to stop and shut down enemy magic, which some armies completely rely on it. And some armies like Flesh of Courts very much rely on their magic and don't really have too many ways to plus their cast and value. Um, okay, so then going on to talk about just the wizard description for him. Uh, this unit can attempt to cast three spells in your hero phase and attempt to unbind three spells in the enemy hero phase. If this unit is part of a Nighthorn, Flesh Eater Courts, Osric Bone Reapers, or Soulblight Grave Lord's army, it knows all the spells from the spell laws in the faction allegiance abilities in addition to the other spells it knows. So that's fantastic. So it's basically just what covering what I was saying that where before, you know, it was a worry that it could maybe get to a cast of about five spells, nothing else cast, he will always be able to use all his spells. Like he won't run out of spells he'll be able to cast, which is really, really nice to see because it's a big part that's making the gash really expensive in the point. So if he didn't have the capability to cast all those spells, it would be rather essentially pointless and uh, very annoying for his costs. So going on to the next ability, we have Invocation of Nagash. So at the start of your hero phase, if this unit is on the battlefield, and you can pick up to five different friendly sunball units or friendly Osiric Bow Reaper units in any combination. For each of those units, you can either heal up to three wounds that have been allocated to that unit, or if no wounds have been allocated to it, you can return a number of slain models to that unit that have a combined wounds characteristic of three or less. So that's very good. Particularly good in uh, Osric Bone Reapers because, you know, there's not really any other way to bring those models back much apart from a Harvester, etc. Um, but in Sublet Grave Lord, still not bad. You can bring things like um, Grave Guard back, a lot of Grave Guard Black Knights, but they're not very good. Uh, Dire Walls, which you probably will be taking. Uh, skeleton Zombies. Uh, the list is not as big, I would say. But you will definitely find uses for it. Like, just bring back, you know, free Grave Guard alone is not bad. Um, particularly how there are other ways to heal units and etc bring back models that this is just a guaranteed way of basically most invocations of undeath in the soul black grave lords are like a d3 roll so if you're trying to bring back like a dire wolf or something it's not always guaranteed that you will but with neck gash you guarantee that you will and with wounds despair essentially 
Um, okay, so then the next ability is more cane, so this is his armor. So this unit has a ward save of four plus for damage inflicted by mortal wounds. In addition, if the unmodified wound roll for this unit is a six, that attacking unit suffers one mortal wound. So yeah, that's good. It helps keep him alive. It prevents, you know, half of all the mortal wounds going to him will be avoided and you know a sixth of all those mortal wounds will be going back to the enemy but i'm pretty sure it used to be might be remembering this wrong but i think it used to be uh four up uh against all you know wounds essentially not just inflicted by mortal wounds so a little bit of a change there annoying but again at least he's still got it because that free up save just isn't good enough to keep him alive for how many points he is and i actually have a time when i played against um a zeech player a tournament with minor gash and i had so many mortal wounds dealt to minor gash by a gaunt summoner as each that i actually managed to roll so many sixes that i managed to kill that gaunt summoner who was on a bellwind vortex and shut down his whole base operations and it was very very cool to see so never you know think that you won't get any of those bouncing back mortal wounds it's generally quite good and then going on to the next bit which is supreme lord of the undead if this unit is on the battlefield, when you use an ability that returns slain models to a friendly death unit, you can either re-roll the dice that determines the number of slain models returned to that unit, or add one to the number of slain models that are returned to that unit. So that's really, really big, especially like we just literally mentioned the invocation of undeath and stuff going on in your Soul Blood like army. You're doing it all the time with all your heroes. This is just not just made Nagash's own invocation of Nagash. Obviously, that's very good. Just a flat free. It's also just saying to everyone else, um, yeah, I make yours better. And if you are trying to bring back that dire wolf, etc., with the sort of two wound thing, yeah, it's brought back or bring back an extra model. It's very, very good. Uh, that buffs the rest of your army because fingers with Nagash, he can't just be a one man band for how many points he is. He has to add so much to your army because he is costing you half your army, right? So that's a nice ability um, and a new one. And then going on to the next ability, we have Death Magic Incarnate. So you can use this command ability if this unit is on the battlefield. At the start of the combat phase, the unit receives this command must be a different friendly death unit. Add one to the ward save for that unit until the end of that phase. So again, just keeps them alive for a bit longer. So it can be anything from, let's say you've gone the, let's really try and stack this, shall we? So you've gone the Castellet sub allegiance right now. I'm not going to remember the name of all the command traits and everything, but... You go on the Castellet sub allegiance. You can go for the artifact, I believe, that basically the aura around your bearer of this artifact means that the ward save goes up to plus one. So that means that your death ward save is now five up. So, you know, let's look at Blood Knights, for example. So now, where well, it's normally six up, it's a five up, and then they reroll ones for their ward save because of their death banner. Put this on them as well. Now that means they've gone from a six up to a five up to a four up and rerolling ones and you could make them also have a two up save normally so you can really see how you can make blood knights as an example uh really really stack their defense and uh, again you could do it with other but other, other example grave guard exactly keep things alive and then you can bring those models back so they're really hard to deal with but it's very good to show just how survival you can make things um going on to the next bit so this is talking about magic now so you got hand of dust which is a famous spell which is always fun to do when you're the one using the gash so hand of dust is casting value of eight bear in mind though with the gash when he's casting these spells refer to the damage table because it may sound like a lot eight but really you just want a five when you roll those two dice because you're going to plus three to it um so it also has a range of three inches so incredibly short range but you'll see why so if successfully cast pick one enemy model within range and visible to the caster then take a dice and hide it in one of your hands or under one of two appropriate containers put it in your hands it's easier if you, if you do have both your hands do that uh your opponent must pick one of your hands or containers if they pick the one holding the dice the spell has no effect if they pick the empty hand or container, the enemy model is slain. So I absolutely love doing this um, spell. You, know, you could do it on tabletop simulator and stuff, but it's really nothing in comparison to when you do it in real life because there's a lot of mind games going on here because you often do it against big, scary things your opponent has, you know, any basically the big centerpiece of their army a lot of the times. 
and this spell can just make all your problems disappear. It's absolutely lovely and the way how you hold the dice and everything else to try and trick your opponent is fantastic and it's one of the only spells that's basically, or not spells but abilities, that survived from the start of Age of Sigma where there are things like if you're playing Bretonnia, you know, hold up a, a chalice and say for the lady and you got to reroll your charges or I think if you were the Tomb Kings and you're playing a Cetra, if you kneeled at any point in your game, you lost because Cetra never kneeled, he never surrendered. So there's just fun things like that and this seems to be like the only thing that's carried over but I absolutely love it. I love those rules and stuff, I thought they were good fun. Um, but the Hand of Dust, uh, some people uh, complain about it, think it's too strong, but I think you're paying so many points for Nagash anyway, uh, you know, and it's got a range of 3 inches, hasn't got a particularly low cast and value, and uh, again, it's still a 50-50, you do it against things like Archaeon and stuff, I'm pretty sure Archaeon has a, basically a 50% chance he's going to ignore a spell done against him anyway, um, you know, there are ways to avoid it, and if you don't, well, you know, Nagash is the Supreme Lord of Undead, deal with it. And again, going on to his last spell is Soul Stealer. So Soul Stealer has a cast and value of 6 and a range of 24 inches, so a huge range there. If successfully cast, pick one enemy unit within range and is visible to the caster and roll 2d6. If the roll is greater than that unit's bravery characteristic, it suffers d3 mortal wounds. If the roll is at least double the unit's bravery characteristic, it suffers d6 mortal wounds instead. You can heal up to one wound that has been allocated to the caster for each mortal wound caused by this spell that is not negated. So this is obviously very good depending on what you're going against, right? If you're going against things with, you know, demons, bravery, 10, etc., it's not that great. You still might get something, but it's not that great. You go against things like, you know, uh, Skaven, uh, a lot of destruction and stuff like that. You've got a decent chance of getting double their bravery and then boom, decent more wounds. And you can heal a hell of a lot of wounds to Nagash. And of course, there are other ways to heal the wounds to Nagash via spells, etc. In the uh, Soul Black Grave Lords. Anyway, so this is just an extra thing he's got on his War Scroll. And like we've already mentioned, Nagash has uh, so much spell potential. He can cast so many spells, eight spells, that he's not really going to be picking through and go, Oh, I don't really know if I want to cast a spell. Might be better cast another one. It's one of the longest range spells Nagash is going to be able to cast. And you might be casting it on turn one. So it'll probably be one of those turn one spells that you'll be casting. As um, things like, you know, Hand of Dust is fantastic, but 3 inch range. So it's harder to cast that on turn 1, shall we say. And then going on to his keywords, he's got Death, Death Lords, Hero, Monster, Wizard, and Nagash. So I just want to say something else that he is missing as well compared to what he used to have. He used to have a Command ability, which is absolutely fantastic. And I think it was called Supreme Lord of the Undead. Um, and basically what it used to be is everything in your army had reroll ones to hit and also had reroll ones to save, I believe it was, and also you didn't take any battle shock. I think that was just army-wide what it was, and it was absolutely fantastic. Made me bring the gash a lot to those games, and the fact that he's lost it is, it's huge, and I get it, you know, there's not really many rerolls in the game anymore, so getting rerolls of ones to hit and to save for your entire army is very strong, but they could have made it, you know, plus one to hit or something, and plus one to save, would have been better or maybe just plus one a hit if that would have been too strong. I mean, Nagash is costing you a thousand points basically at the end of the day. So you do want him to have all the bells and whistles and not his bells and whistles get taken away from him. Um, but Nagash, in a summary, do I think he's worth taking? I think Nagash, I wouldn't say he's just flat out every time. Oh, take Nagash, you're playing Soul Black Grave Lords wrong if you don't take Nagash. None of that sort of stuff. Again, looking at a competitor stance. But I think that you can make Nagash worth taking i think that's the better way of looking at it i know there was a time and it might still be a case where like a lot of people were taking a gash in their like most competitive soul like grave lords list but i don't think it's necessary and um but i think he's still useful and he can still be very good but you need to support him with things like um you take a vengorian lord it makes the enemy uh, minus one rend against him so effectively gives Nagash basically another plus one to a save um, if Neferas is in there, you know, you can do things as well. But all these things are now adding a lot of points to your army and you don't have many points left over. What if you had a Vengorian Lord in the Gash? I mean, I can't remember how many points a Vengorian Lord is, but you're looking at probably about 1,200 points, something like that, if not more, uh, 1,200, 1,300. So really, then you've got like 700 points left over, you know, for your army. So there's not a lot you can do. It's a very sort of specialist build. I mean, again, I've ran Nagash in a uh, Avangori list, and uh, it was just a bit of fun, basically. It wasn't, like, super competitive, but 
the gash and basically a bunch of terror guys. And it was like, yeah, have fun. That's, that was the list. And it was like, whatever I moved or attacked with was a monster or wasn't a gash. And it was an absolute blast, um, essentially. So you can really still have a lot of fun with him. But you can also still make him competitive as well. But he's not essential in the army. So I think, really, that's the best combination. For him to not have to be a must include. Because it's like, oh, I can't play Solid Grave Lords unless I've got Nagash. Uh, you know, you never really want to have too many auto includes in an army, I think. Um, and then also the fact that he can be used as quite a bit of fun. You know, he's a great model to use. He's an absolute beast on the tabletop. And he adds a lot to your army as well. And then also you can use him to make your army competitive. So I think he fits fantastic all rounder for everyone. And uh, I think 955 points is a lot of points for him. Maybe I think it should come down in points. But again, there's a lot of heroes out there. And especially a lot of monstrous heroes. So something we didn't mention was things like monstrous rampages and um, heroic actions, I believe they're called. And what that means is it's just other two ways that you can buff Nagash to make him even more powerful. So essentially what you see in the war scroll, you know, like I say, like the stats of to hits or freeze and freeze, freeze and force, etc. That's not realistically what you'll see in the game. There'll be buffs for him which they can't really try and implement on the war score, so they've got to try and, you know, factor it in when they come to do his points. But when you look at his points at first, you might go, you know, how the hell was Nagash 955 points? You know, how can I justify putting them on my list? But he can make him work, and he can be very good. And that is my summary thoughts with him. And with that, that also ends my series on the Soul Blight Grave Lords. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. It's a long in-depth series. Probably by the end of it, it would have been about, I don't know, about 10 hours, just guessing. Uh, it covers anything from lore to every single thing in the Soul Blight Grave Lords army. So go check out the other videos if you'd like to. Share any of them with your friends if you'd like to as well. And then that really leads on to the question of what am I going to do for my next long in-depth series. Now, as I mentioned in a few videos at the sort of start of this year, um, I'm not really playing as many games as I used to by far. Like I had a game, uh, what was it, about seven days ago? And that was my first game of Age of Sigma since September. And just for reference, now it's halfway through March. So you can see how little I'm playing at the moment. So I don't really want to talk about uh, if I did like a long in-depth series on, I don't know, Carolyn Overlords, like I've mentioned before, you know, I'd be talking out my ass. If I'm telling you, I can explain to you how to play them tactically. Don't have any experience with them. Don't really play the game as much as I can. So it would be dishonest content and I don't want to do that for the sake of views, etc. So I'll be turning to a lot more things like uh, hobby things that I am actually working on the second paint tutorial for that. And other sort of aspects in the hobby that I'm working on at the moment. And maybe things like smaller games, etc. But I will still do these long in-depth reviews. Um, of armies for armies I play not just for every army in Age of Sigma because I wouldn't be very good content and I don't really want to just make you know uh, quantity over quality at the end of the day I want to make things that I think I can do a good job with but anyway guys so I really hope that you enjoy this video if you do remember to smash the like button the subscribe button the bell notification massively helps absolutely free um, if you'd like to share this video with anyone or you would want to join the Discord, there's a link to the Discord at the top of the description down below where I've had quite a few people ask me questions and comments for videos lately and I've honestly answered the questions best I can by saying there's people with more knowledge about this army or this subject in the Discord, ask there and they'd be more than happy to help you and people have been doing that and it's been absolutely fantastic. So if you've got any more questions, make sure you join the community in the Discord and ask there. Lovely place to be, really be friendly and it's a great escape from all the horrors in the world right now and to just focus about hobby. Also, if you would like to, as I mentioned, support the channel, there is a join button, there's a subscribe button, and then there is a link to my Patreon, which is at the top of the description down below. And what I will say about that is that all the money that I am being given from last month and then this month from YouTube and Patreon, which at the moment, like I say, is about uh, roughly £90 a month, and that's all going straight to um, charities to help out the situation in Ukraine. So that's things like um, the Red Cross and stuff like that. And I actually did a donation from the channel um, last night, which was uh, £100. So that's just to let you guys know that all the support you've given to the channel has gone directly to help um, people who really, really need it over there, refugees, etc. I think it was something like £60 or £70 bought like 60, you know, those like thin mattresses you can use for camping and all that sort of thing so the money you guys have given to the channel has managed to make people you know like 60 people if not more sleep easier at night or it said something along the lines of the 100 pounds allows them to be able to set up enough equipment for a medic in a, a refugee camp or something like that or supplies the medic with the medical supplies they need to be able to do their job over there which is absolutely amazing i just thought 
um, saying to just tell you guys, uh, you know, fantastic. Thank you for all that support. Uh, for helping those people, lovely, and um, hopefully we'll continue that going forward. And again, if you would like to support the channel, the money will go straight to those charities, but I'm not trying to like um, leech on that or anything. I would recommend you guys support directly to the charities because uh, Patreon and YouTube will take a cut before it gets to me. So if you're not a member or anything already, just support the charities. That way it's better than doing it through me. And uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for that. It really is helping people in desperate need. And um, the people who were partly responsible for that are going to be my patrons and my YouTube members. So I'm just going to read through their names now as they are absolutely heroes. So my biggest support is my Vampire Lord on Zombie Dragon, if I haven't already mentioned that title enough in this video. And that's going to be Philco. So Philco, thank you so much for all the support you give the channel. Honestly, it makes a huge difference in keeping the channel going. But obviously, like I said at the moment, it's a huge amount of support you're giving to help people. So thank you so much for keeping that up. And then my Morgas being Bleed Red and Gold Swept Dandy. Guys, thank you so much for giving a lot of support, especially at that tier. Again, being a Morgas is a lot of support you're giving and you're helping. So it does make a big difference. Thank you so much. And then my Vampires, who always says the core that keeps us going, it's going to be Ben C, Rouse 321, David A, Dragon Nitty, Ronnie H, Darren L, Spare Bear, Christopher H, Nathan Drop, Nathan F, Andrew G, Tom W, Wiggy Hooty, and Nathan S. Guys, thank you all so much for doing that. And thank you as well, particularly for my vampires, for being able to stick through with the channel as we've been going through quite a bit of a dry bit at the moment with terms of content for me being able to put out uh, just due to real life being busy. So thank you all so much for being able to keep it up because I know a lot of you guys have been supporting for a long time. And then, of course, my necromancers who just consistently give support to the channel is going to be Jack L, Wolf Nick, AW77, Tom M, Michael W, Cranky Wombat, Krista C, Krista F, Steve T, James T, James S, Thomas B, Patrick F, JJ, R, Christopher, Seption, Sean S, Gordon W, and Val. Guys, thank you all so much for all the support you give. And like I say, at the moment, it's going to so much more important than help keeping the channel going. So please keep it up. It really is helping. And with that, guys, anyone like to become a supporter, help out that way, like I say, Patreon link in the description down below. Anything from Dora a month. And then click the join button, become a member here on Asian Gash, anything from just a pound a month. So if you'd like to do that, that'd be amazing. If you can't though, no worries, just smash the like button, the subscribe button, and the bell notification. Absolutely free to do so. And if you do enjoy the videos, honestly, please, it's just really easy for you to do that. And uh, like I say, more people are liking the videos, seeing the videos, the more, well, it's only a small amount of money, but the small amount of money from YouTube gets a tiny bit bigger, which obviously goes to a good cause at the moment. So. That'd be amazing. And as always, if you feel like you know someone who would enjoy this video, make sure you share it with them. And above anything else, guys, I just hope that you're generally doing well at the moment because, like I say, the world's in a bit of a difficult place for the last, like, three years, if not everything else that's been going on before that. So I hope you guys are doing well. I hope you have a great rest of your day. I thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Remember until next time to stay safe, wash your hands, stay hygienic, stay safe. The other things I say, wear a mask if you got to, and then beyond that is remember, more importantly, is that Nagash is all, and all is one in Nagash.